Before we begin today, there's uh, two other things we're going to do real fast. First of all, as uh, hopefully all of you know, uh, if, if you're new here, you may not know this, so if you're visiting. Um, and if you're visiting, by the way, I'm Pastor Tom. I'm the campus pastor here. I never remember to tell people that. I just assume the, the world knows who I am, so <laughs> I'm, I'm not prideful at all. <laughs> so, um, But a few weeks ago, more, a little more than a few weeks ago now, we as a church voted to disaffiliate from the United Methodist Church. And because of that, what comes about is that now the work begins to go through that process of disaffiliation. And one of the things is coming up with the money to disaffiliate. So as you guys were made aware with all this, it's around $300,000 to disaffiliate. It's a little more than that. Um, but there's good news about that, so don't get too stressed about that. There's good news. And some people think, well, why would we pay that much just to leave? And uh, there's two reasons we're paying this to leave, and this has nothing to do with the denomination. This just has to do with the money part, okay? Uh, number one, you know, the thought is, well, we could just leave the building and not pay anything, right? And we could uh, just go start another church somewhere. Theoretically, that's possible. However, this is a multi-million dollar building that we can get for $300,000. So if you look at it that way, we're getting a bargain on our building. <laughs> so if you could get a $200,000 house for $20,000, you'd jump on that all day long, right? But here's the bigger issue, the bigger reason why this is why we have this money to pay. None of this is punitive money that we're paying. All right, part of this is because as a church, we agreed to pay uh, the retirement of our pastors in the past. So uh, like Pastor Dan McBride, who was here forever, and we love Pastor Dan, right? Um, he's part of this group of pastors from, I want to say the date's 1982, when it was a different retirement plan, that we made an agreement that we would continue paying into. So that's where some of this money goes to. The other part is to pay our apportionments, and that's because we're leaving, but we still are supporting ministries around the world. The United Methodist Church still has ministries around the world, so we had an agreement that we would help with those ministries. So just so you know, none of this money is punitive. We're not being punished to leave in the Upper New York Dist Annual Conference. We've actually been very lucky compared to a lot of places around the country. So don't think of this money as punitive. This is just what we need to pay because it's what we had agreed to pay anyways over the next couple of years. So now for the thing about coming up with the money. Pastor Joe passed out things, uh, cards, to, so that we could... Um, pledge that we would help with this move. We voted to leave. Uh, we had 95%. I think it was 108 people voted to leave. Five voted to stay. It was a huge percentage voted to disaffiliate. So Pastor Joe, we've been passing out pledge cards and asking for people to pledge and volunteer money um, towards this. So here's the exciting part. The exciting part is already we have had $54,379 be pledged for this disaffiliation. That's, that's good news. <laughs> so. Out of that, $36,879 has already actually come in even. So not just pledged and we're going to get there eventually, but we're already at this much that's already come in. So we wanted to get to celebrate that today because this is exciting that people are saying, yes, we know this needs to happen and they're willing to step up and put their, their money where their mouth is in this case and say, we will help with this process. And we are so thankful to this congregation who is always so generous in everything this church does. So we just wanted to celebrate that today. Next week, Pastor Joe is going to give you a little bit more information about some other stuff to do with this as well. But we wanted to have a moment to celebrate. And one of the things that this church does, God is working in this church, right? God has done some awesome things, and we have been focused on prayer lately, like Pastor Joe said, and Rick Ruprick wants to come up, and he wants to share something about how prayer has uh, affected his life and, and helped him uh, recently. And I didn't let our sound team know this was happening, but... There you go. Good morning. Up, oh, are we... Good morning. 
Okay. okay. <laughs> Six weeks ago, on the first Sunday of Advent, I stood in the sanctuary over there and announced that I was going to have open heart surgery on December 14th. And I asked for your prayers. I guess I didn't really understand how many prayers could be offered up. Um, I was on prayer chains in two different states with churches that I don't even know and don't attend, okay? Um, the surgery went incredibly well. The doctor said it was the most complicated surgery he did all year. I, I think it's pretty obvious that my recovery is going incredibly well. Um, I just want to say thank you to every one of you who offered up even one prayer. Okay, you're an amazing group of friends and an amazing congregation. Thank you. Amen. Thank you, Rick. <clears throat> God is on the move in this church, and he is doing some incredible things here. And we've seen answer to prayer over and over and over again. For our sermon today, our title is, uh, So You Want to Be a Disciple. And I want to start, so... In a couple weeks here, January 28th, and look, I know I'm getting old, so I remember this very vividly. A lot of you who are under 40, you will not. Uh, but January 28th, 1986, 37 years ago, it's the anniversary of the Challenger uh, disaster. Now, I don't know if you remember that. That, for a lot of people, for me, uh, I know, is one of those events in history that you don't forget where you were at when it happened. So I was in school. And I was actually in the, the cafeteria having lunch because it was 11.33 um, in the afternoon when it happened. And uh, they wheeled in. So if you're, you're my age, you know the old TVs that would get wheeled in from the, I think it was called AV or tech, when it wasn't tech back then or IT. Um, but that TV got wheeled into our cafeteria and they had the, the space launch, the shuttle launch on TV and we're kind of eating our lunch, and I'm watching it, and I'm a huge Star Wars fan. I love sci-fi. I love space. So these things always fascinated me. So I'm watching uh, as uh, Challenger takes off. And it gets um, into the liftoff, and everything's going fine. And then all of a sudden, something strange happens. All you see is smoke and different th parts fly in different places. Now, to my mind... That I don't know what's going on. I mean, what in the world just happened here? This, they, they don't make mistakes at NASA. They brought back Apollo 13, right? We've seen that movie. We know that that happened. This, this can't be that this was just destroyed. And it really took some time for me to process what had happened that day. And that was huge for our nation. We didn't expect anything like that to happen. Now, after a while, it's discovered that really this didn't need to happen. That disaster could have been avoided. There were warnings. There were people speaking up. And yet, we all remember, those of us who are older remember that it did happen you know in our own lives many of the disasters that come upon us don't really just come upon us they're usually brought upon us by something we have done by a choice that we or choices that we have made if we want to be disciples there's a few things that we do so that these types of tragedies don't occur in our life. We assess where we are at. We assess the decisions that we're making. Then we get affirmation of those decisions. It's one thing for us to look at what we're doing and try and rationalize it in our head, 
but it's good to have godly people around us who can help to affirm that is my assessment accurate and what am I going to do with this information? And after we've assessed and we affirm, then we have to apply. When we begin to apply what we've, the knowledge that we've gained from those assessments and affirmations, that's when our life change begins to happen. The challenger tragedy didn't need to happen. Many of the issues in our own lives don't need to happen. Would you open with me? We're going to read in 1 Peter. And we're going to talk a little bit more about the challenger um, incident, so I'll, you'll hear a little bit more about that. So we're reading 1 Peter 2. I know this says that we're skipping around. We're just going to read 2, 1 through 10. Therefore, rid yourselves of all malice and all deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and slander of every kind. Like newborn babies crave pure spiritual milk, so that by it you may grow up in your salvation, now that you have tasted that the Lord is good. As you come to him, the living stone rejected by men, but chosen by God and precious to him, you also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For in scripture it says, See, I lay a stone in Zion, a chosen and precious cornerstone, and the one who trusts in him will never be put to shame. Now to you who believe, this stone is precious. But to those who do not believe, the stone the builders rejected has become the capstone and a stone that causes men to stumble and a rock that makes them fall. They stumble because they disobey the message, which is also what they were destined for. But you are a chosen people a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we thank you for this word. We thank you that you have revealed yourself to us through your holy scriptures, Father. We pray that you would speak to each one of us through your word today. Not just this passage, but every passage that we read. We know that we get far more from your words than any words that I speak or anyone else speaks, Father. So I pray today that your spirit would be poured upon us and that you would speak to us through your word. Reveal to us what you would have us know about yourself and about ourselves, Father, and do a mighty work in us today. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So the beginning of this passage, Peter says to rid yourself of all malice, all deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and slander of every kind. How do we rid ourselves of the things that we are doing wrong especially before we know maybe that they're wrong. We have to assess our lives. We have to first know that the issue is there. Before each shuttle mission, NASA would inspect the ships. They would do an examination and an evaluation and assessment of that ship. After every mission, they would do the same so that they knew what had happened while that ship was in space. They knew what had happened as it was coming back into orbit. There were always evaluations and assessments going on. Why would you bother to assess these things before and after? You see, I said that that disaster didn't actually need to happen in 1986. In 1984, the Challenger went up as well. That was the one I think that Sally Ride was on, the first, uh, one of the first women astronauts in space. I think it was more than just her as well, but she's significant um, later on. 
after the Challenger landed and they inspected the ship, what they found was that some soot had made it through the primary O-ring of the Challenger. Now the obvious problem with this is nothing should be making it through an O-ring between your rocket fuels. So they knew that the O-rings weren't always holding tight, that there were some issues. Later on in 1985, through some more assessment, they realized that they needed to improve some things on the shuttle. So late in 1985, well, mid-1985, I think it was June or July, they order some new construction to be done that would change the shuttle so that those O-rings would, number one, be better protected and there would be lips around to hold the, the seal in place on the rocket boosters. Those parts that those changes would be made a year later. Unfortunately, it was five months after the shuttle was destroyed. They had assessed what was going on. They knew there was a problem. Many of us in our jobs, we assess our work, right? We assess how things are going. We ask ourselves, how can I be more productive? How can I be more efficient in my job? Hopefully in our families, we are asking, how can I be a better mom or a better dad? We assess where we are at. But one area that we tend to neglect the assessments is our spiritual life. How often do we assess where we are at in our relationship with God? Really assess, really look at where am I in my walk with God? Haggai tells us this is why we assess. Haggai 1, 5 through 9 says this. Now this is what the Lord Almighty says. Give careful thought to your ways. You have planted much, but have harvested little. You eat, but never have enough. You drink, but never have your fill. You put on clothes, but you are not warm. You earn wages only to put them in a purse with holes in it. This is what the Lord Almighty says. Give careful thought to your ways. Go up into the mountains and bring down timber and build the house so that I may take pleasure in it and be honored, says the Lord. You expect much, but see it turned out to be little. What you brought home, I blew away. Why, declares the Lord Almighty? Because my house, which, we re which remains a ruin, while each of you is busy with your own house. Therefore, because of you, the heavens have withheld their dew and the earth its crops. Why do we assess? Because if we're not constantly watching, assessing where we are in our walk with God, we can be heading down a path that leads to disaster where we are putting ourselves above God. The word of God isn't what's important. We don't know him through his scriptures. We know him through our own thoughts and our own rationale. If we aren't constantly assessing where we are at in our walk with him in our spiritual lives. We need to assess our lives as Haggai tells us to our spiritual lives. So how do we assess our spiritual life? Lamentations 3, I'm going to read, I'm going to jump around a little bit here in Lamentations 3. We're going to read 40, 41, 50, 57, and 58. There's kind of like little psalm things in between <clears throat> these sections. Let us examine our ways and test them. Let us return to the Lord. Let us lift up our hearts and our hands to God in heaven until the Lord looks down from heaven and sees you came near when I called you, and you said, do not fear. You, Lord, took up my case. You redeemed my life. So how do we assess our spiritual life? First, we lift up our hearts and our hands to God, and we ask him, where am I at in my walk with you? Where do I need to improve? Where do I need to grow where am I falling short? You should all be used to Psalm 139 by now. 
I know every time I do communion, I share Psalm 139, 23, and 24. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there is any offensive way in me and lead me in the path everlasting. We pray that prayer. We ask God to reveal to us the areas that we need him to grow us, where we are still babes drinking milk when we should be eating meat. And when we pray that prayer, when we ask God to reveal, God, where do I need to grow? Where do you want me to to improve? We don't just get up and walk away from that prayer. We sit and we listen for God to speak to us, to reveal the areas that we need to work on. God will help us as we seek to assess our lives, as we seek to discover where we need to grow and where our strengths already are. And as we do this in the immortal words of Robert Frost, this will make all the difference. Once we have assessed where we are at, once we have asked God and really sought, where do I need to grow in my life? It is important for us to affirm what we think we have heard, what we think we have learned. Peter tells the churches of Asia Minor in this book, First Peter, that they need to rid themselves of their sins and begin living holy lives. And then he assesses where they are at in their walk with God. He assesses as well. They are babes in the faith. And as such, they should begin to crave spiritual milk. Now he tells them later on that they are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation. Even if we are not where we need to be right at this moment, we are still loved by God. We are still a holy people, a holy nation. But we need to be looking, growing, and then finding people around us who can affirm where we are at. Paul does the same thing in 1 Corinthians when he tells uh, the, the church at Corinth, Brothers and sisters, I could not address you as people who live by the Spirit, but as people who are still worldly, mere infants in Christ. I gave you milk, not solid food, for you were not ready for it. Indeed, you are still not ready. You are still worldly. For since there is jealousy and quarreling among you, are you not worldly? Are you not acting like mere humans? Now, I would dare to say that much like this church, they probably all thought that they were good with God. I show up every Sunday. I check my stuff off my checklist. I read and I pray. Oftentimes, we need others to help us to reveal our blind spots. We need to be going to other people. At NASA, people had warned them that this O-ring was going to fail. Not only because the soot that had made it through two years earlier, but because the shuttle had never been launched in a temperature under 52 degrees. And scientists studying this understood that this would be detrimental to the O-ring. And after it was assessed, and a group of scientists takes this to NASA and they say, "We we need to stop this launch. We need to postpone this launch. It was decided there were levels of accountability in NASA. And this was level three, I believe they said. And it was decided it wasn't going to go any higher up the chain. The people who made the decision said, no, we're going on with the launch. They had assessed. The scientists had tried to affirm. But the affirmation wasn't accepted. Again, there are times when we need others to reveal our blind spots. We need to take our assessments to other people and hope that we get wiser counsel than what they got. Even if we pray and we ask God to reveal these things, and even, God, even if God does say, reveal to us, 
I need you to work in this area. I need you to let go of this area, this sin in your life, or of this addiction, or whatever it is. We go to other people as well. In Galatians, this is confirmed. When Paul says, um, I'm sorry, I'm lost here. I didn't write down where this is. In Galatians, it says this, Suppose a brother or sister is without clothes and daily food. If one of you says to them, go in peace, keep warm and well fed, but does nothing about their physical needs, what good is it? In the same way, faith by itself, if not accompanied by action, is dead. But someone will say, you have faith, I have deeds. Show me your faith without your deeds, and I will show you my faith by my deeds. You believe there is one God good. Even the demons believe that and shudder. You see... The next thing we have to do, I'm completely lost in there. The next thing we have to do after we affirm, after we get affirmation of where we're at, where we need to grow, is to apply it. When we don't apply it, it means nothing. At the space shuttle, they didn't apply what they knew. And it led to catastrophe. In our walk with God, when God speaks and says, you know what? I need you to step out of your comfort zone and begin using your spiritual gift for this or that. I need you to talk to this person. I need you to go here. And we affirm that with those around us saying, is this my spiritual gift? Is this what you would have me do? Then once we know this, then we need to apply it. Because it doesn't mean anything if we're sitting in a pew reciting the apostles creed saying oh yeah i believe that i believe in god the father almighty maker of heaven and earth i believe in jesus christ his only son our lord i believe these things but then we walk out the door and we live as though we don't believe it because remember as paul said in galatians even the demons believe they really believe to the point that they shudder when they hear the name of god if we don't take what we have learned, if we don't apply it to our lives, we are no better than them, than the demons. We have no faith if we are not using what we learn and applying it to our life because faith without those worth works, faith without response from us is dead. It isn't faith at all because if I have faith in what God has told me, I'm not going to question what has been told. I'm not going to question what I've learned about my life where I need to take that next step. I am going to live into what God has told me to do. Faith without works is dead. When we assess and we know what we're supposed to do or what's wrong, what needs to be fixed. And then we have affirmation that, yes, this is what needs to be fixed. We must apply that to our lives. And if we don't, where are we? Are we really following Christ? Jesus said to his disciples, if any would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Will you do that today? Will you let go of what you think to be true? Learn the word of God. Seek God in all things. And then take up your cross and deny him and follow him. There's one more thing real quick that I want to share with you that I got lost and I missed it here. Too often in our churches today, we are following what we feel. If it feels good, do it. If it feels right, this is how it should be. But in Lamentations, no, in Jeremiah, we are told that the heart is deceptive above all things. Our feelings are valid. What we feel, we really are feeling. But it doesn't mean they're true. Just because it feels like it should be right, just because it feels like it's what I should be doing, it doesn't make it 
right. We need to be open to just trusting the word of God, not our own understandings, not our own feelings, and then to take up our cross, deny ourselves, and follow him. Will you do that? Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, reveal to us the areas where we have gone astray. Reveal to us the areas where maybe we haven't been stepping out of our comfort zone and doing what you're called us, what you have called us to do. And then, Father, help us to have the courage and the boldness, the strength to deny ourselves and follow you in all things, Lord. Do a mighty work in Jesus' name. Amen.